Hello and welcome back to the Hand Toolery. I'm Andrew Malacy. Today I'm going to be making a green wood bench out of the oak tree that my parents gave me that they cut down in the yard. It's going to be like a staked bench and it's not really going to be a tutorial because there are many better examples out there than what I'm going to do. For example, just go watch the Woodwright shop. There's a great example on staked furniture there. But first thing I did is I had to actually go out and split the oak uh, log. Just did that with a sledgehammer and a wedge. And although this log, as you know maybe from the last video where I made the bowl, had quite a number of knots in it, I was able to get a good like five and a half to six inch deep, more or less, board, the full length and about good two inches thick. Here you can see what I was left with after splitting it and then I took the hatchet to it and came more or less with these billets that you see here. Some of those will be the legs, some will be other little stools I'll have for the kids and this one here is what will be my bench that I mocked up in SketchUp. So since I've really got no experience in making this kind of furniture, I just decide to go to SketchUp, like I said, mock it up and then from there I determine the angles I'll need because uh, I can just use a protractor and a bevel gauge from there to figure out the legs play. Really nothing glamorous here. I'm just starting with the scrub plane and trying to get it as flat as possible. And then from there, I'll take the uh, forward plane and the joiner plane and whatnot just to get it in nice and flat and true. And I'll take the winding sticks and again, make sure that's flat and true and not, not warped or anything. Now that I've got one face more or less flat and ready to go, I can start working on the edges to square everything up. So I'm going to knock off the high spots with the hatchet first. And from there, I'll just, again, take another joiner plane to it. Scrub plane first, and then joiner plane. And like any other time that you square up stock, uh, you just got to mark your lines with a marking gauge to get a good parallel set of edges. I'll hatch it down or remove the bulk of the waste like this, trying not to destroy the edge on the concrete floor there. And after that, another uh, round of scrub plane and joiner plane, etc. And this is the bottom of the piece, but it actually end up being the top. So I'm going to make sure that this is exactly the way I want it to be. Now for the display of the legs, I just printed out this protractor, moved the angle and transferred it over to my bevel gauge. And then I marked out exactly where the, the legs are going to enter the bottom of the bench. And from there, I transferred my bevel angle onto a small block of wood there. And now I'll have two opposing pieces that are the same angle that I need. And in all transparency, these were not perfect off the saw. I had to plane them down. And there we go, two that are exactly the same angle, and I'm going to use those as guides. Again, on the Woodwright shop, there's a great episode about staked furniture with Chris Swars, and they talk about sight lines and using bevel, only one bevel gauge to guide your, your boring here with your bit and brace. But I found it a little bit easier for me to not have to worry about the sight lines and setup, just knowing the angle because I mocked it up in SketchUp and then just making these sort of template guide blocks. But if you have no idea what the angle is going to be, if you just want something that looks good and you don't know what to do in the 3D computer program, then the sight lines are the way to go. And again, you're going to want to watch the Woodwright shop to get that. Keep boring the whole end until the, the tip of the bit comes out and then stop, back it out and bore the rest of the holes. We're not going to be flipping back and forth to finish a single hole. Just bore all the holes at once and then flip it over and come back the other way and finish the holes from the top side, just reversing the template blocks. Don't really need them, but you know, 
and this is what I mean. Once you flip it over, you can reverse the guide blocks so that way the angle is going away from it instead of in towards it. And then you can just finish the hole that way. And I've got myself a billet for a leg, which I'm just trying to get roughly square. I really don't care about perfection here. I just want four flat sides that are square to each other, and that's really it. Because then I'm going to uh, octagonalize it, or I'm going to make it into an octagon. And, and everything at this point is just by eye. I really don't care if it's all symmetrical, if it's all perfect. Because I just want it to look good, and just get it close. What I'm doing here is marking out how deep the actual tenon will be, the length of it. And I'm going to then mark the center of the end of the tenon, so by making an X at the end. From there, I'll take the bit and brace, and using the actual bit that I made the mortise through the seat with, uh, it's a one inch bit, I'm just going to make a quick circular impression on the end of the tenon, nothing too deep, just so it leaves me basically layout lines that I'll transfer down the length of the tenon down to those uh, stopping points. And that'll help me be able to saw away down to a depth, and then uh, saw away or pair away down to this tenon. It's going to be a circular tenon, cylindrical, rather than conical. And again, on the Woodwright shop, Chris Schwartz and Roy Underhill, they recommend using a self-tightening conical tenon because as the wood dries, it doesn't matter because it'll keep, as you sit on it, it'll keep wedging itself deeper into the mortise. And the reason why I'm not doing that is because it's simply easier and I don't have the actual tools and I'm not going to make one for this. Uh, so it's just easier for me to make a cylindrical tenon rather than a conical one. And there you go. We've got one leg fit, three to go. Not bad. And to save you from having to watch me do that over and over again, I've gone ahead and just fast forwarded. I painted the ends of this with like a, an outdoor paint because I didn't want it to crack anymore. It was starting to open up on the ends, obviously because it was drying out in a climate controlled house and that did help quite a bit. Here I set it on a part of the floor that was pretty flat and level. I put a level on the floor actually, and I'm just testing to see if the bench itself is level, and I'm just wedging it up until the bench is perfectly level uh, in both directions there. Now I've just laid out my, um, my square on the floor. It's one of those wood squares that we all have, and just marking uh, a line all the way around. And that's basically what I'm going to cut away to get the right angle of the f of the bottom of the legs there. And here I am cutting. It's a little bit of a difficult, precarious cut, but if you just follow your lines and take your time, it's not that bad. To make a square into an octagon or a rectangle into an octagon, you just basically uh, draw a line down the edge about a quarter of the way in, and if you do that on all sides, it leaves a half in between your lines, and then you plane down to about a half between the two lines across an adjacent corner. And so, if I connect the lines by planing away the corner, I should have pretty close to an octagon. 
And then from there, it's just by eye. I make it what looks nice to me. I'm just not that concerned with it being perfect because I kind of want the rustic look. It's going to be an outdoor bench, more or less. Not gonna lie, I found this whole process quite a, quite a bit tedious. First squaring up the legs, then turning them into octagons. Using only planes just was not ideal. And so I went out and did get myself a draw knife for my birthday after I had already finished this bench and the two children's benches that I made for both of my kids. And so in total I made 12 legs and turned them into octagons, made three benches, a large and two small ones. and. Uh, I definitely think that if I do this more in the future, I will have a little bit better of a time with the draw knife. But here we are in more or less the final assembly. Some of the legs, three of them, fit better than the last one. And I'm just going to let it be that way for now and see how it all ends up fitting after everything dries out because I'm expecting the bench top to suck down on the tenons a little bit and I've oriented them that way. But yeah, I'm pretty pleased with the fit on almost everything here. And after this, I'm just going to flush off the top of the tenons and put finish on it. I'm using walnut oil as the main finish here. And then after this dries, I'm gonna put some paste wax on it. Nothing needs to be really durable for this. Uh, we just are gonna leave it on our porch and take it outside to roast marshmallows and then bring it right back in. So it really shouldn't be in the elements. You know, I learned a lot making three benches, and it means a lot that it came from the tree at my parents' house that we could save a piece of. I'm looking forward to making memories and eating marshmallows. So yeah, the bench is a bit big for them, but that's okay. It's for the parents anyways. I made these two little stools there for them, and it, they both nest nicely under the large one, which I think is a pretty cool metaphor. Anyways, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.